welcome back to La Cancha. And with you this week, I brought in a special guest. It was meant to be a celebration of Valencia's Copa del Rey victory, but we all know that that's been out. So I'm just going to bring on Abira to speak about how we started supporting Valencia, um, what he thought about the cup final, his feelings going into the cup final. Abira, it's been 24 hours after the cup final. How are you feeling? Thank you so much for having me on the La Cancha podcast. Yeah, I feel like going, going into the cup final, it was mixed emotions, you know, playing against a Betsy side that defeated us 4-1 earlier in the season. You know, although that was very early in the season, a lot of things changed after that. And you could see from that that like, there was a lot of fight and passion in the team yesterday. But then in generally, it's it's not it's not it's not an Eden fact that Betis is a stronger team than Valencia and like Pellegrini is a much better coach than Bodalas. But as a Valencia fan, there was still this hope and this belief in my team that we could go on and win it. Although I'm disappointed, though, well, I'm Valencia in loss and in victory. Yeah, especially, Adria, especially given how they played. Like, that was a brilliant performance by Valencia. They were so good on the counter-attack. Like, me, myself, I was hoping Valencia won, but... And I didn't have faith in the team, especially in the first couple of minutes when Juárez Iglesias scored. I was like, oh, no, a 4-1 is going to happen again. But when Hugo Duro got his chance, he made sure of it. And it seemed in the second half that Valencia was the team that were going to win this. I felt... Right up to the penalties, I felt Valencia would Right, Adira? I think the, the, the pe- going into penalties was very unfortunate because in the first half, Betsy's dominated the game here and there, creating chances and all that, and like missing and all that. And the Moriba chance for Goduru was just a one time thing, a mistake from Betsy's defense, the, overla- the overlapping fullbacks. And like he capitalized on that. That's what Goduru is very good at. When the second half, yeah. we could see that Valencia were all about Betis, trying to get yeah. go, trying to get that one more goal to to finish up the match, which didn't end up coming coming in. And the introduction of Brian Eel into the game late in the second half on Betis' third legs also helped. And there was this Soles miss chance too. Oh yeah, at the, right that. at the end of the game, that chance <laughs> right at the end of the oh. game. So I feel like generally the general feeling was to finish up the game in nine, within 90 minutes. But that didn't happen. And very unfortunate for Musa to have missed that penalty. And a great performance, you have mentioned, a great performance by Medajvili. Saved close to three, oh, man. <laughs> three goals. Three goals. Yeah. Great performance. At that age, Honestly, very young group yeah. for a lot of experience. And that was a very good performance from him yesterday. And yeah. the belief is there. The team is a young team. Yeah, it was fantastic with Mama Dash for me because if Jaime was in the goal, it could have been the game could have been over in ninety minutes. The game, the game could have gone very differently if it was either Jomi or Slicing. No disrespect to either of them in the game, but Mama Dash really there's this type of confidence that you get that okay, yes, there's this goalkeeper that gives confidence to the defense, especially when Bodala switched to a three, a three-man defense, three center back. With the improved performances of the Akavi and Polista's experience with Alderete, that's yeah. been a very good. He, he, he went on like a five plus match run with clean sheets without conceding a goal at all before the um, Osasuna game. Yeah. And like, yeah, yeah he's, he's, he's a very young goalkeeper, four year contract, and I, 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 we're going to see much more of him next season. I hope so, but where do you think Valencia goes from there? Because ever since we went on that five-match run of like month season goals, it was like the mindset was, hey, we're going to focus on cup. Even the midweek game against Villarreal, but the last rested like nine starters. And it seemed like the entire season was banking on this because we know the consequences, right? If Valencia doesn't make Europe, we have to sell players. Yeah, yes, yes. It's 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 very obvious because we, we, we have the lowest wage cap in the league at the moment and which might reduce next season because no European income whatsoever. And as you have said, the whole Valencia season was depending on this cup final, on this cup win. 
it was very obvious since since the first day we got into the final. Very, very obvious. And now that we have lost, it's we're going to lose some players. Geddes, definitely. You look at Geddes like a player who there'll be a lot of interest for him come this summer. His performances have been what what's it? What's the amount paid for him some years back? Yeah. Although just showing it now might, might not might not be what everybody wants, but then performances have been crazy, crazily good. It's singularly yeah, it, qualified us for the final, you know. Yeah, and he, he came to Valencia as a young kid, and so I can understand why people are like, oh, he's so bit of a rated, but things like this take time. Yeah, they take time, and we get this. It, it's the inconsistency over the years under Garcia, Celades, Marcelino. But Bodala just seems to have a way of bringing the best or like pushing players to their limits for him. Yeah. yeah. Getting the players to play well for him. And we see that we get this. The yeah. Eyes go so around, you see Even Fokir. Fokir was amazing in that. <laughs> I remember that run he had where like he took out Joaquin. Yeah, I, I, th- I think that was, in, that was in the second half. Like, that yeah. run where... And, and, but then, failure to create something meaningful out of that. It has, has always been a <laughs> problem with Fokir. Failure yeah. to create something meaningful yeah. out of some chance, also some clear chances or some clear instances where you can create chances or create something for the team, he ends up doing something that, that is not reasonable. That's the only problem with Fokir. Probably stupid crosses or crosses that do not make sense and all that. Generally, his work rate has never been in question. He's a player that works very well for the team. And I think that's why Bodalas loves him. He's a Bodalas kind of player. And with Diane Soler, those are two hot topic players for Valencia because their contracts are about to run out. I know yeah, as a Valencia cool. fan, we'll love them to stay, but do you think in their best, it's in their best interest to leave the club? Given what we've seen from think- Pareko and Coquelin and Colombia in the Champions League? As, as a fan, I, 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 I will not be blind. I'm not blind to whatever it is that is going on at the club. We, so, so let's ask him, according to the, to, to the report, so let's ask him for close to 6 million euros per year. And I, I don't think Valencia can pay that. I don't think they can pay close to that. At most, he, he, he leaves as a free agent in two years, in 2023. The same with Gaia. They leave as free agents in terms, except if next season we can somehow qualify for Europe. But I don't see that happening because there are no funds to purchase players. There, there are no funds. The wage cap is going down. Each season in, season out, each season, our wage cap keeps going down. There's no, there's that's no way out for fault. the club. At this that's Bitsalem's fault. He's a billionaire. I said that's Bitsalem's fault because yes, he's a billionaire. That's his fault. He should be able to pay. But he has refused. He has refused to invest in the team. He has refused to invest in the team. Promises he made eight years ago have not been fulfilled. The stadium is still there, uncompleted, not touched since he entered, it, since he came into the club. Unfulfilled and, promises and all that. We lost Parel Coquelin in 2020. Parel Coquelin, Rodrigo, Ferran Torres. The team became weak. Yeah. And, and now, even with, now we might be yeah. getting some consistency or stability. We might go through that phase again. Yeah. And the funny thing is, or enough funny from Valencia's point of view, when Pizzolin first became the owner of Valencia, Betis got relegated that season. And to have them come all the way back from relegation, go through their struggles. And as you said, for the final, Betis are a better team than Valencia, which I don't think should happen given the fact that we have a rich owner. Valencia has, has a richer um, history. We've had the players we've had being there in 2019. Like you said, we've lost Rodrigo, Ferran, Pareco, and Coquelin. Pareco and Coquelin, we lost them for close to nothing, for peanuts. And you see how they play against Bayern Munich, and you're like, that should be us. Yeah, as, as you have said, Valencia, Valencia is a club richer in history than Betis. Two consecutive Champions League finals. I don't think Betis can achieve that in some years to come. No disrespect to them. We have a richer owner who has refused to invest in the club. The transfer strategy is poor. Sold Parero and Coquelin for next to nothing, as you have said. Next to nothing. The club, the, club is, the club is being run down by incompetent people. People that do not know have any 
any knowledge on anything football at all. They are running this club down. And I, and I think, as you have said, Betsis were relegated when Putalin came in. For them to come up, go through those struggles, go back down, go back, da go down, go through those struggles, come up, rebuild that team, and be able to compete with this Valencia team and even defeat them in that cup final is a disgrace to Putalin. It's an embarrassment to this team and to this team, to this club as a whole. There is oh, no thanks. way on earth you have expected Betis, after what they have gone through, to come up and yeah. be competing or say they are a bigger club than Valencia at this point in time. Yeah, they are, because they're competing for the Champions League. And <laughs> Valencia is like mid-table, which is, which is exactly. something that I wouldn't have imagined when to see to go. But we are, um, we, are, we, are 10 points, we are 10 points of a conference league place, which I know at this point in time, what might not be is not achievable again because I do expect all the other teams above us, Villarreal, Suicide, Osasuna, to keep on losing games. Yeah. You know that yeah. you know that, that, that that's practically impossible. The whole yeah. team, the whole year, this whole season for this team has been based, all hopes have been put on that cup right now, and which we have failed to deliver yesterday. We have failed to deliver yesterday. Yeah. And there's no going and, back from that. Yeah, you can't really blame the players or the coaches. They did they did they did a job. Penalties are yeah, they did the job, they performed. Yeah. Yeah. So to take to take Betis into penalties with, with the type of team Betis have. If you if you look at the game yesterday, Valencia could only make three or four substitutes, but Betis made complete six substitutes because of the squad depth they have. Yeah. I think as, aside Grand Team, Terry Korea, and you know Snusa that I that I brought on and Ratchet also. Yeah. There was no other player on the bench except Cherry Shell, no. Marcos Andre. Marcus Andre is one investment that has refused to pay dividends. Eight million yes. and nothing, nothing to show for it at this at this stage of the season. Yeah. Not up to five goals at this stage of the season. Yeah. Investments, that's right. that's investments right. has made no reason at all. Yeah. But yeah, I do I started to cut you off, but like there was also another team. <laughs> it's not a Valencia podcast, there was also another team mm -hmm. on show. And I want to bring in Oscar for this. Like Oscar, mm -hmm. how big of the victory is that it for Real Betis? Yeah, it's massive for the club. Like you said, like we've all been saying, 17 years without winning the trophy. And it was the boyhood fan, um, Juan Miranda, that delivered the sports kick that gave them glory. You know, Joaquin is what might be his final season. You could just see on his face at full time the emotion. Like everyone in Betis has been dreaming of a night like this for years. and. It's paid off, you know, all the work that Pellegrini has done since he came in, because he came into a team that finished 15th under Ruby and was disappointing. Or Iglesias had the worst season of his La Liga career, and then Pellegrini has come in and revitalized everyone. The Panda is now a supreme predator, you know. Yeah, he was dangerous. Yeah, yeah he was dangerous yesterday <laughs> again. Yeah. And that final, I feel what I like about his performance is his hold of play was second to none. The way he brought players into the game, this passing, like he had that one pass for one year that was just genius. Yeah. He, but it was almost a wrestling match at times with the Valencia center backs because all three of them are very physical. But Borja is no pushover too. He's physical too. And he did the hold up play parts really well. You know, he's a, he's a, pretty much a complete center for it. Like if you ask him to do anything, he's able to do it, you know? And yeah, it, it was a great performance from him. He won man of the match for the final. He's the top scorer of the competition. Well-deserved. Yeah. Well-deserved. I want to talk about Manuel Pellegrini for a bit, because this is a guy who's been in Spanish football for a long period of time, almost the same time as all of us have watched it. Mm -hmm. And he's been at several clubs and he's always achieved things like at the Real, he took them to their first semi finals. And that club, they were nowhere near like the level they are right now in terms of the years of experience. And here they are, they're at semi finals against Arsenal. They could have or should have won, given if we're coming up, converted penalty. He went to Real Madrid and he achieved Real Madrid's second highest points tally in Real Madrid's history. But he came up against the Guardiola's Barcelona. Mm -hmm. He had to go right for Jose Mourinho the rest of his history. He goes to Malaga and he turns that club from a club that's a yo-yo club essentially to Champions League quarterfinalists. And they should have they should have beaten Borussia Dortmund if Bar was there. 
but mm-hmm. he, had, he had never won a trophy yet. And he goes to Real Betis and Betis, they're called, everyone knows the potential. They're the third most supported team in Spain or fourth. And he brings them the first trophy in 17 years. How good of a manager is this? Is I think one time I made the list of the best La Liga managers this century. He was pretty, it was a pretty good place on the list. He's such a good coach. He he has a plan, like he's he's an engineer and he always sticks to it, you know. He doesn't like even if Betis were having bad results at some point, he's like, no, we have to play attacking football this way, you know, with the fullbacks and everything. At Malaga, like you said, did a wonderful job with a team that wasn't doing too well. Villarreal, the same thing. He's, he's at least called hero status at those three clubs. At Real Madrid, like you said, he was great too. It's just, you know, circumstances being what they were. And he's yeah, won yeah. teams abroad too. Yeah, even at Manchester City, for example, mm-hmm. like he took them to the first ever Champions League. Yeah. And that was at the time in the Premier League where they were struggling to do well in the league. And so took them to the semifinals. They had a couple of chances against Real Madrid. Who knows what would have happened if they got to the final. But I'm, I'm happy for him. He's always been an early man in Spanish football. And I'm glad like he finally won trophy. And I even forgot something in his very outside. He, he took them to second. Season. Yeah, second in the seven or seven or eight season. season that was yeah. a great achievement. And one of his star players, like the players you can that he's included most this season, was Juanmi Jimenez, who yeah. he didn't really. He had a decent cup final, but he should have been more clinical in those periods. Yeah, he he had that chance that Borja made for him that he really should have put away, and then. He had another chance where he hit the outside of the post. Other than that, he was pretty quiet from one knee. But uh, yeah, again, a player that has really improved under under um, what's his name? I forgot. Pellegrini. <laughs> yes, I almost called. I almost called him Bordalas. Bordalas, yeah. man. Yeah, because yeah. Bordalas has improved players too. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Let, let's talk about Bordalas, and because he got his tactics for the team spot on. Mm-hmm. Like if you. Like he gave like basically a PhD on how to play teams that are much better than you in terms of quality and mm-hmm. but yeah, it, Bordelas was great in how he managed the team because everyone in Valencia knew what they had to do to stop Real Betis from playing because after Valencia got their goal, Real Betis were kind of hanging on when it came to counterattacking situations. Real Betis had some opportunities, but they were few and far between. And when they did get those opportunities, Mama, that really, as we discussed, was wonderful. And yeah, on balance, you would say the more dangerous potential opportunities came to Valencia for the rest, for like majority of the 90 minutes. Yeah. And as we discussed, like Valencia going forward, um, but give your own opinion. Yeah. What do you think would happen next season? Do you feel it's possible for Valencia to maybe improve on this, given that we might lose a couple of players. Yeah, it's, it's going to be difficult if you lose Gedres, but it means there's always an opportunity for someone else to step up and take that role. So it's all about who can take the opportunity. Like we discussed, Marcos Andre is not his best season, but we know that he's a, he's a, he can be a good player if he stays fit. So. That'll be interesting. Also with Solar and Solar and Get and Gaia, I think will stay this season. Yeah. But they might still have the contract disputes. Yeah. And Borderless. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go on. It, going back to um Boy Iglesias. Mm-hmm. Valencia had the chance, and Adore, you, you might pipe in. I'm not sure whether you remember, but Valencia had a chance to sign either Boy Iglesias or Maxi Gomez. The first season. Maxi looked like he was the winning bet. But after after Pellegrini has come, it's like every every frustration Valencia fans have with Maxi Gomez, or Iglesias seems to be like an answer to that answer. Yeah, it right? feels that way. Adora, what do you think? I think in general terms, in terms of ability, generally, I'll pick Maxi Gomez 
over Boah Iglesias. I, I don't think Boah Iglesias has scored as much goals in a season as Maxi did at Celta Vigo in, in a La Liga season, the, the yeah. season before, before he got signed to Valencia. I think the, the only problem Maxi has at Valencia is the team is not creating enough chances for him. He does not have enough big chances or enough chances there for him to pounce on or for him to, for him to score goals on. And yeah. that, that, that difference between him and Ugodro is Ugodro Ugo can create goals from anything. Ugodro can create goals from anything. Pounces on mistakes from opposing players or opposing defenders. But Maxi is just a different breed. He's one player who needs the team to create chances for him and can't just do everything on his own. His old up play is perfect, but the team needs to create more chances for Maxi to be in full gear, in full force. So, so still I agree with that. Yeah, okay. And on Real Betis, right? They have this chance. It's, it's amazing they won a cup now, but the season could be even better. They could match what they did in 2005 if they qualified for the Champions League. We've already seen this week Athletes come in period drop points. And now we've seen Barcelona <laughs> in a week where they could have made certain that their top four cement. They drop points to Rai by Cano and Cadet. Oscar, how? How? Oh, by being as bad as I've ever seen us in the past two years. Like, honestly, some people go overboard on how bad Puma's team was. I don't believe Puma was that bad. It was just the ending was not good. But the thing is that under Puma, we used to create chances or just not finish them because the players that were getting the chances were kids that I don't expect to be clinical. Against Cadiz, against Rayo, and against Frankfurt until 100 minutes, we didn't create much at all. And that's kind of worrying because it's, a, it's as if when we face a low block now, a team that just comes to defend, we have no idea. We're just hoping that they can give us space in transition because in transition was the only place we looked dangerous today. And then, you know, it's, it's typical, like, honestly, it's like Cadiz and Rayo got their plan spot on, like it went without a hitch. We could have provided hitches, but then the players decide to make unforced errors, stupid decisions. Yeah. I don't want to be too harsh here, but it's, it's, not, it's just not good at all. Like the players need to remember they're playing for Barcelona and not in their backyard with their friends. Yeah, but what changed? Because a month ago or a couple of weeks ago, Barcelona looked stoppable. It looked like they were going to rampage through Spain, maybe fall back away and fight Real Madrid for the title. But that, that's yeah. all changed. It seems like we're seeing a more gloomy Barcelona like some that we saw at the start of the season. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pedri's injury is massive because the stats show that he's really important and we score more with him, we create more with him. We've not lost this season in the league with him. That says a lot. And yeah, without him, we're only limited to Gavi and Frankie to play in those positions. And two of them look like they're kind of burnt out. So I don't know. I, I think I saw somewhere like someone was saying maybe Xavi should rotate a bit because even Ferran Torres looks jaded, Obamian looks jaded. Some of the mistakes we've been making at some, at like in these last two home games, feel like mistakes from mental fatigue. So I guess m- maybe trust Luke De Jong and the time more to create something a, attack. Yeah. I have a question, right? Do you think Real Madrid's recent run has mentally affected Barcelona? Because after the international break, there was so, so much optimism. Mm-hmm. from Laporta, from the directors, from the coach, from the team, that Real Madrid were eventually going to drop points and that was going to be the opportunity. But then Real Madrid mm-hmm. wins in Vigo, they win in Sevilla, in Sevilla and, and they win not sooner as well. And now it feels like hey, there's no way Real Madrid are going to win the side. But all that motivation, like, we can win the league. Yeah, it's kind of, yeah. that's an important point because I f- it felt to me more like against Cadiz, like the team played like there was nothing to play for. Like if they assume top four is safe when I don't think it's safe yet, the way we're trending. And 
because we are marooned in second, it's like Real Madrid, we're not going to catch them. So what are you really playing for? So yeah, I think in some way, Real Madrid's run has affected us a little bit. But that shouldn't be an excuse to be playing like this. Yeah. And so, right now, an idea you can chime in soon. Top four, three positions. We believe five teams are still in it. Who makes it for you? I think I'll, I'll say Atletico, Barca, and Sevilla. I, I, I don't think Betis have what it takes to get to get to the top four ahead of Sevilla, Atletico, or Barca. But the cup run, as, as we saw with Valencia in 2019, the, the top run can do a lot of wonders. The cup win, sorry, can do a lot of wonders in, in the league, in their league form and all that. It's, it's really crazy what a trophy can do to your season. But Betis have the players, they have the passion, the tactics, and the and the coach to be able to take them to that position. But at the end of the day, I think Sevilla, Barca, and Atletico edge it out for me. Exactly. And Oscar, who do you think? I think the top four will start this. As is. And do you have confidence that Barcelona will keep second place? Okay. I have kind of looked at our five games left. We have three games against Celta, Betis and Villarreal. These are top half teams. And then we okay. have... Don't two... disrespect Hetafe. Oh, it's true. Hetafe are pretty much safe, but who knows? And then Mallorca, who desperately need points. So I'm looking at my... We tend to do better against higher placed teams in quotes. So I guess we'll, we can hold on to second because Atletico and Sofia have tougher games left and have to play each other. So I'm hoping, yeah, that, that. big hope, we <laughs> hold on to second yeah. because if we if we somehow bush top four, man, I don't know what I'm going to do for the whole summer. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be so true. But a word on Rai Rai kind of because they've done the double with Barcelona. The second time they won at a campaign. And we see this team, they hadn't won before in 2022. So it's just amazing that what they've done. Yeah, they've gone to Barcelona, beating Espanyol and beating us. And they're going all the way back to Madrid, knowing that they are almost mathematically safe. 40 points. They're basically safe at this point. Yeah. They, yeah. yeah it's How would been, you grade your season? A success, really. A big success because... They were a team that came up that survived not getting in, that survivably get got into the playoffs. And no one was yeah. even expecting them to qualify to the Primera from there. So having got into the Primera and stayed up comfortably for the most part, it's been an excellent season. They just have to and build on it and make sure that this bad momentum that happened at this point of the season doesn't happen next season. That's true. And let's not forget, they were also in, in the Copa de Rosa. Yeah, that, that too. That was also excellent. Yeah. And moving on to the big, the big Madrid brothers, Real Madrid, just one more point to the win the league. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Atleti fans must be so scared of this because Atleti, Real Atleti fans, yeah. <laughs> Atleti fans must be hating us right now for messing up like this because they will probably have to give Real Madrid a see you. Yeah. <laughs> That'll be so embarrassing for them. Yeah. Uh, but with Real Madrid, La Liga is done. We all know that. Everyone knows that. Yeah. Now it's the Champions League. Manchester City. Gabriel Jesus just scored four goals. The next <laughs> Holland, maybe. <laughs> Should they be worried about Gabriel Jesus' form? Although we know City, they have a few problems in defense. I don't think they should be particularly worried about Gabriel Jesus because up until Saturday, he scored four, three goals all season in the league and he scores four against what for who are not who are not very good to be put in kind. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even think Gabriel Jesus will start because Pep has other options and we know that he's allergic to playing actual number nines. Yeah, I don't know. Manchester City is going to be a big 
tough ask for Real Madrid, especially as Real Madrid have some injury doubts. But if anybody can do it, it's them. It's them. And who's this a pretty game for? City or for Madrid? Come again. Like, who's it a bigger game for? Manchester City yeah. or Real Madrid? I'm going to say it's a bigger game for Manchester City because of the obsession they've had with wanting to win the Champions League. If Real Madrid don't win the Champions League, I don't think anyone will call their season a failure because they got to the semi final, beating some strong teams along the way, and they've won the league at the counter. So I'd say Manchester City and Pep Guardiola, the pressure is on them more. And if Real Madrid are to win this, where can they hurt City? Like you said, the defensive injuries are a big thing for City. So it depends on who the matchup Vinicius Jr. has on that right hand side. If it's going to be against you know, someone who is not Kyle Walker, then they can really damage them back there. Because I think Walker has injury problems too. On the left hand side, probably if Ake, Ake has had his own injury problems too. Vinchenko is the other option at left back, but he hasn't really played much. So, yeah, I think in the flanks, the full back position is where they can hurt City. In midfield, yeah, they need to, they need Fede for this one. Yeah, they really do. Like, and you made a call for Fede against Chelsea, and that worked. And that worked. But Just that worked. Fede, I, the, the time against Chelsea, I said play Fede and Chris Modric and Casemiro. This time, just don't play Chris, at least <laughs> at away from home, because in the second leg against Chelsea, he looked overwhelmed. That's yeah. we, re- we reward Mr. Champions League Rodrigo with his start. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll see what it makes Manchester City one garden as well. But moving on to the other English Spanish tie, Liverpool, they they look in, in Paris form at the moment, beating Manchester United 4 0. But it seems everyone can beat Manchester United. <laughs> yeah, that's, a, <laughs> that, that's not really a feat. <laughs> yeah, it's not. Villarreal, they won against Valencia, but we're not sure because Valencia, their minds were elsewhere. It seems Villarreal's minds were elsewhere. The game felt like a preseason friendly, whatever. Mm. But now it's the tenth against the big boys. Yeah. And they do it for the third time. Oh, is that too much? <laughs> is that too much of an ask? The fact that they beat Bayern when nobody gave them a chance, even I, who is very optimistic for them, thought it might be beyond them. It's possible. Like, no one should call Villarreal a weak team because they're in a bloody Champions League semi-final. So if anyone could shut Liverpool's awesome attackers down, it could be Pau Torres and Albiol again. I think yeah. attacking-wise... Scoring against Liverpool is going to be harder than scoring against Bayern because, especially if Jared doesn't make it back for this one. But you know, Liverpool, not all their defense is solid. So if they can find the weak spots and basically just take something reasonable back to La Ceramica for the second leg, I think they have a chance. I think Ben Arnold, that might be the opportunity, but the only problem is. Arnold, there's a lot there, so you don't need to allow it. But I feel that yeah. might be the best chance of attacking Liverpool. Yeah. But but the one area of concern I have for them is Liverpool. Tonate looks like an absolute beast in the aerial game, <laughs> and from yeah. corners and from set pieces. <laughs> and yeah, Liver- so Liverpool far, are a very good crossing team. So yeah, and there's going to be a, we're going to see a lot of crosses on. We're going to see more crosses in, than in a church when these two meet. <laughs> yeah, I, I did, but, yeah it's, it's going to be a lot of aerial deals either way. Yeah, but, but it seems like Paul Torres and Raul Abio they dealt with a lot of against Juventus and against Bayern. But I just feel Liverpool with Konate, with Van Dijk, they carry a different threat. Yeah, yeah much different threat. Yeah. And any, I guess, from a Liverpool perspective in, in the attack. How would you expect Pau and Raul to deal with those three monsters? Yeah. Here's the thing. Liverpool played very differently to Bayern in that the, the wingers are not really wingers. They are, they are, let's call them what they are. They're basically strikers. Because yeah. all three of them are within the width of the penalty box and then the width 
on the flanks is provided by the fullback. So it's the marking system is going to have to be very different for this for, um, for Villarreal. I don't know if yeah, Kapu might have to drop a little bit deeper than he normally does. So yeah, it will be interesting to see how Emery deals with this different problem. Um, yeah, and in the league, it seems like things are looking up for Villarreal. They're three points behind Ralph Sosie bad for the Europa League. Will it be a failure if Villarreal can get top six? No, no, no. Take, getting this far in the Champions League has obviously taken some steps. So yeah. I don't think it will be a failure. Yeah. It's but more about, for... it's more about, you know, I don't know if you've heard about this meme. Like, it's not about the treasure; it's about the journey. <laughs> the journey. I guess. Yeah. yeah. The friends we made along the, the way. The friends we made along the way. <laughs> yeah. Like, like our yeah. in quotes title race. So yeah, I think yeah. <laughs> this might apply here. Yeah, and for Ralph Sosedad, what happened to them offensively? Because I saw after the game, I, th- I believe it was the menu. It's like, oh, we black goal all season, right? And I quoted a tweet. I was like, you. We black goal this in this game, and of course, the tweet we black goal all season. We fought a goal yeah. all season. Mm-hmm. What happened to Isak? He looks like a shadow of himself. Yeah. It's not like real sisters that don't create the chances. They create the chances. It's just recently in twenty twenty, Isak's form has been bad. Let's not sugarcoat it. It's been bad. Yeah. Sarlot has been. A bit good in 20, a bit better than Isak in 2022, but not by a crazy amount. The only person that was really performing the attack was Arfabal, and he's injured for the rest of the season. Also, as we've discussed, his form took a most dive this season. I, I don't know, I feel Russell yeah, if they want to not be stagnant, they need to make changes. Yeah. And does that include the manager or should he stay? Uh, the manager, I mean, keep him at this point. The, un, unless you can find someone that you're sure is an upgrade. But for now, I guess just keep him. He hasn't really done yeah. anything sack worthy. Apart from losing Borneo to the biggest rivals. But <laughs> just uh, uh, that, that's bad. That's bad. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? Like, my personal opinion for us is that they are, they are where they are, they're where. It, like, I feel they're performing at the level, not too high, not too low. If they make it to the conference league, I feel that's their competition and they'll do very sure. well. Like, I don't think they're a Europa League le- level team, but they're, I know I trip on Imanol all the time, but they're well coached and mm. he's coached them well enough to be in the top six. And that's, yeah. that's good for them because before Ross was that they weren't a team that finished in Europe every single season. Yeah. So we, we can say, yeah, it's kind of their scene. Yeah. yeah, Sevilla, they used to struggle with goals, but they started scoring more recently. Nine goals or seven goals of games. Bono <laughs> Zamora's record looks in trouble, as you mentioned. Oh, God, he's taking in those yeah. guys from 0. 0.6 <laughs> to 0. 0.8. Yeah, but with Sevilla, they changed it to four, they changed formation to 4 3 one and it seems like that's working. They're creating more goals, but just defensively, they, they seem to be struggling. So. Yeah, it's the, it's the balance because without Fernandinho, they, they've had to adapt. And yeah, they're Fernando. in the situation. <laughs> what the hell? Fernando. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a rough day. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, without Fernando, they've struggled. They've, they've struggled with how they used to play. So now they've had to adapt to a double pivot. And, yeah, it's about you score three, we'll score four now for them. Yeah, yeah Lopetegui must be like pulling out his hair because it's yeah. kind of magic. It's like one zero, I'm good. Yeah, he's, he's stepping out of his comfort zone a lot now. Yeah. And their opponents, Levante, man, I felt so sorry for him. It's like, did you see the images of him after the game? Yeah, I saw it too. It was heartbreaking, man, seeing him cry after. Missing the penalty that would have made it to two. And it's just he feels so responsible for his advantage team because he's basically take like by the international break, he thought they were dead and buried. They had just lost three new sooner. Since the international break, he has 
morphed into Messi 2012, and he's been carrying Levante on his own. He's gone four games in a row scoring, having assists, but it might not be enough, and it's really sad to see such a good player and such a leader break down like that. But you know what? I don't think it might be over for Levante, right? Because look at the yeah. pictures. They have the Valencia and Derby next week. And given how Valencia, they poured out their hearts for the Copa del Rey, that might be a winnable fixture. <laughs> I'll get a jurors' opinion on it later. <laughs> they have Real Sociedad. They have Real Madrid, who've already won the league. They have Alaves, who they seem as hopeless as any other team I've seen. And they have Rai Vaitano at the end of the season, which by then they would have already been safe. So it's not looking too bad for them. Yeah, it's not looking too bad, but but then you know it's it was a missed opportunity yes. against Sevilla, and the fact that a certain club has helped Cadiz to get points has not helped them. <laughs> yeah, the common crazy. I think it's possible for them to win all their games. But it's possible. Yeah, it's also possible for them to lose all of them. So it's, yeah, but <laughs> yeah, the last thing it's Levante. That's why we love them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It, but even Cadiz, they lost to Athletic, so it doesn't look like things are that hot for Cadiz. And to wrap, to wrap a ball and everything, who do you think will go down out of the bottom six right now? Okay. Realistically, I see Mallorca staying up. I see Cadiz. I, I see um, Cadiz just staying up. I see Levante finishing above Granada, but it might be too little, yeah. too late. And they just miss out on maybe one or two points. Yeah, I said Mallorca is staying up because they're definitely going to win their next game. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. That will be four losses at the Camp Nico Barca. Crazy. Adura, who are your, who are your three to go down? I feel like Levante... Granada and Alaves. Generally, for me, I want Levante to go down because they are a very good team. Which other teams like Valencia, without without enough budget, can pick on players like Enis Badi, Campania, mm-hmm. El Comandante. They are, they are players that can improve our team very massively. Yeah. If Levante <laughs> go down and cheap. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, that, that is true. That's true, but. Let's, let's move away from La Liga. Let's go to Serie A, where there was a big game. While Barcelona were busy losing to Rayo Vallecano, AC Milan had a massive comeback against Lazio. And Inter also won the suit. So that means that the race is still there. It's still tight. Like, can, can Milan pull an upset here? It depends on Inter's game in hand. If they... If Inter mess up their game in hand, then I think Milan can hold on. Yeah, yeah I, feel, I feel that way too. And it'll be, honestly, you know, I'm partly an Inter, but it will be a nice story if they can run Serie A this year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just because of all their run and all. But like, the one team I can't get over in this type of race is Napoli. Are they oh, born butlers or, or what? I mean, they're botless. There's no other way around it. Like, I, I was, I was checking the score. Right, I saw they were winning two 0 against Empoli. I'm like, okay. I go on Twitter and I hear no way Napoli have done it again. I'm like, really? <laughs> you lose three two to Empoli. God. And Pinamonti and Interloc. Pinamonti. <laughs> Pinamonti has more league goals than Osimhen, or the same. Oh my God, that's embarrassing, bro. <laughs> it is. Yeah, yeah, not that's... only they, they, they don't make it easy for. They're like Dortmund. Just yeah. <laughs> you, you hope Both. they can do something. Like they're everybody. They're like everybody's favorite team from their league, from those respective leagues. But yet, they yeah. fall up short. Yeah, I remember listening to a podcast ages ago and. One of them were saying that maybe like somewhere there they hope Napoli never wins the league. So every time they remember people remember Napoli's last league win, they remember Maradona. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. <laughs> but you're right. They're, they're like Dortmund. Dortmund who saw Bayern's coronation when they lost their pasta. It wasn't as bad as we thought it was going to be in terms of... Yeah, uh, it wasn't the but... massacre spectacle we were expecting, but, you know, yeah. Dortmund, Bayern's goals came from typical Dortmund def- defensive errors, you know, basically guiding, um, guiding Bayern to the goal. Yeah. It's, so, it's so frustrating from a Dortmund standpoint. Also, not taking their chances. I also felt that Dortmund could have gotten a second penalty, but yeah, it felt that's what I do. Too. Yeah, and like Pavard doesn't get the ball <laughs> at all. Yeah, he gets the man before he gets the ball, so I don't know what was going on there. Yeah, yeah. like and it's Bayern's tenth consecutive Bundesliga title, which is a very polarizing statement, right? Because people would say, okay. It's the Bundesliga, it's the most foreign league in the world. We've all heard it, right? But in some ways, they have a point in that Bayern winning all these titles is not healthy for the league. But still, this Bayern side, I and this is something I honestly believe, can do it in any league. Of course, yeah. People talk as if Bayern wouldn't come to their league and slap everybody there. Yeah. And so yeah, it's like, like it's like why would you discredit somebody that's doing so well? Like look at UV. UV won in row and now we're seeing how hard it is to maintain success. Yeah. Same thing with yeah. us. We won eight in eleven years and now 11, yeah. we can't beat Cadiz. <laughs> yeah, and with Bayern, right? I feel they carry the flag for German football so much in the Champions League, in that they are the one German club who has won a European trophy since the beginning of the 21st century in both the Champions League and the Europe League. Maybe this season it can change because there are two German clubs in the Europe League semifinals. And even yeah. when people, the main criticism of Bayern from like fans of other clubs is, well, but Bayern, they still the talents of like Leipzig and Dortmund and all these other clubs. But I'm sorry, they didn't Sancho go to Bayern Munich, Kai nope. Havertz, Werner, Konate. Nope. Nope. So, yeah. It's not like they, oh, well. it's not like they get, pick all of them and put them in their team. No. So, yeah. And obviously, and the teams that take, making sure like talented players from your league don't go to other big teams in other leagues, it's a good strategy, whether people like it or not. And obviously, the 50 plus one rule means that some clubs, that mo- clubs in Germany can't just go and get bank ruled and everything. Yeah. It's like, you're, it's, it's just like, the topic of you know fair play for the fans versus giving away everything just to win silverware, you know that debate. And I'll, I'll also say that I feel Leipzig, Leipzig to some extent they ran Bayern close, but they lost a lot of players. And they lost their manager this season to to Bayern. But I also feel Dortmund they've recruited poorly. The choice of managers have not turned out great since Thomas Tuchel. Yeah, you had to chop and change managers, and some people weren't even convinced with Marco Rose in the first place. So I don't know if he's going to stay after this. Holland, everyone and their grandmother knows that he's going to leave. So what did they do in the summer? Do you think he's going to City or Madrid, or is uh, he waiting for Champions League summer? I think he'll go to the city regardless of anything. I don't think, I don't think he'll go to Real Madrid if Benzema and Mbappe are there. Uh, yeah, speaking of Mbappe, PSG, they won the French League this weekend. Good for them. Good for them. First title for Mauricio Pochettino. He's he's gone away with his bottling allegations, hasn't he? Yeah, the bottling allegations are dead. <laughs> Actually, he, he, he won the league, he won the cup last year, so. He kind of died a bit past that too. Yeah, but yeah. It's not, it seems like not all is well at PSG because the Ultras, they walked out of the stadium at, after 18 minutes when they were sure that Lens wouldn't turn the game around and win. So yeah, it's like everyone in the PSG has acknowledged that it's been a pretty mediocre season. The Champions League collapse was obviously very bad, but in Ligue 1, almost every time I watch them, they struggled to win or they would win by hair's breadth. So, you know, a lot of things have to change for PSG. 
I think generally, the one thing that has to change with PSG has to be their transfer strategy. The type of signings they make are not the right type of signings to go forward as a, as a team or as a whole. They just spend money like because they have the money, not just because they want to like build a team that wants to compete for trophies outside France. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I agree I've also, I've also had to, yeah, I agree. I agree with that. I've also had this discussion with Oscar. Is does PSG want to be a serious team like a Liverpool that wins trophies, or do they just want to be entertainers? Because there's room for both models. I just feel the entertainment, the antenna model might not work if you're in France because people who write you along the they don't rate the French league that high. I think generally it, it, it is clear for everyone to see that every season, every year, PSG aims to do one thing and aims to go far or win the Champions League. Because to them, the French League is, 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 is just one thing they just do every year, go there, compete, and just win it, take it back home. But they want to win that Champions League. But the transfer strategy and all, and the way they act, the way they spend money is not going to allow them to achieve that in years to come. If, yeah. if, if you look at the PSG Academy, there are a lot of players that come out from PSG Academy and go out and be great at other clubs. For instance, oh, Unkunku, for sure. Unk- Christopher Unkunku having a great season, although his past season might not have been as great as this season, but then he was never given a chance at AC Milan. Mike Mainan at AC, I mean at PSG, so yes, yes. Yeah. AC Milan Even, also, one of the best players in the world right now. Go keeping yeah. errors cost them the game against Real Madrid. Go keeping errors from Tunaruma. A goalkeeper would they yeah. pay FT wages. Yeah. Yeah. If, and if, if on LT Yeah. You look at the bonus figure, right? The top, I'll say, out of the top four, three players, three of the teams have really good players from PSG. Bayern F. Coleman. Uh, Leipzig, as you mentioned, they have in Kung Fu. There's Musa Diaby, plays in Labour, because all from the PSG Academy. So you have talented players. Within the academy, yeah. So for all four of them, <laughs> yeah. It's crazy yeah, because and... when signing players, also PSG tend to look outside France. They tend to look outside France. Generally, you think okay, a player like Kamavinga going to Madrid, yeah. the, the first option should have been PSG. PSG should have gone to try to sign him, but that does not happen at PSG. Yeah, it doesn't sound like Diego Carlos, right? He should have gone to PSG. But you're right with that strategy. With Lionel Messi, he hasn't had the best of season. Has it been a success or a failure at PSG? Just taking this one, me. Yeah, yeah, take it. <laughs> success or failure? Yeah, uh, I don't know. It's uh, He's killed an assist. His assistant, his playmaking numbers are good. His goal scoring numbers have been bad, so I don't, I really don't know. Yeah. I think, like, like um, Adora said, the objective for PSG that everyone knows is to win the Champions League. So, in that sense, it's been a failure because Messi didn't show up like the rest of the team, didn't, didn't really show up in the second against Real Madrid. So, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a difficult question to answer because. It depends on what PSG see as success. If PSG really value Lugon, which I, I, you'd hope they do because at some point they'll stop winning it and then they'll see like, oh, it wasn't as easy as people made it out to be. I guess in some ways it's a success, in some ways it's a failure and they can just hope for a better second season. Absolutely. And I guess in the GOAT debates, like Messi versus Cristiano Ronaldo, Cristiano Ronaldo fans don't have anything on Messi in terms of giving out Messi the next year to him. But I just want to say a quick, like to Cristiano, he obviously lost mm-hmm. his kid. Um, so, like, all strength to him. He scored a goal against Arsenal and he dedicated it to his kid. But, and Messi and I said things haven't exactly gone according to plan either for us. Yeah. They've gotten hurt now, but for now, to the end of the season, they just have, it's just about, it means it's like the final pages of a divorced marriage. It's, it's been pretty bad. Between January and February, they did not make the most of some of the easier fixtures they had. And now that they've had Liverpool, Arsenal, and now Chelsea to come, 
they've just been slapped around everywhere. Even when they faced an Everton team that are in danger of relegation, they still got beat. You know, a lot of the players are not even trying in the pitch. Besides I maybe think- besides maybe Ronaldo, De Gea, Varane, and to some extent, Sancho. Not many people have given a good account of themselves this season. Very much. I was going to say the team now is disjointed. Like most players are not playing for the team or just play maybe for their own benefits, or they're not giving any any show per se or to say that oh yes, we're actually players that deserve to play at Manchester United, one of the biggest clubs in the world at all. For ten for, for ten ag, it, it would be a great service to him if United do not qualify for Europe was to give him more time next season to be able yeah. to build and like his values and have time for the players because this season they might not qualify for Europa League or Champions League it's possibly conference league and yeah. bigger Manchester United. yeah and a word on Arsenal right because they were hot we were speaking about them maybe they get back in Champions League they went a bit cold they lost games against mid-table and lower-table teams, but the results this week have been eye-catching. 2-4 against Chelsea, winning 3-1 against Manchester United. Can they do it? Can they get over the line and come back to the Champions Yeah. Uh, Between out of the teams in this Champions League race, I think they're the best equipped because Tottenham have been uh, been good one week, bad the next week, and Tottenham have hard fixtures. I'd say harder fixtures than Arsenal going on to the end of the season. So what needs to happen is that Arsenal need to make sure they beat West Ham next week because West Ham might be distracted by the Europa League. And then next week, Tottenham also played Liverpool. So top four could be wrapped up fast for Arsenal by the time they get in North London Derby, which is yet to be played. Sure, and they can celebrate St. Tottenham Day again. Finally, <laughs> for the first time since 2016. <laughs> <laughs> in all honesty, for us now, it should have been wrapped up. Dropped nine points against Southampton, Brighton, and Crystal Palace against mid table yeah. teams. Imagine not, yeah. imagine not beating mid table teams. Couldn't be my oh, wait. And I, and I can imagine <laughs> the type of effect those nine points will have on their season if they don't qualify for the Champions League at the, come the end of the season. Yeah, it will be yeah. bad because they could have been above Chelsea by now. Yeah, it's a brilliant job by our chess has done. Is done. We, no one thought he could do it at the start of the season, but given the squad he has, which is a very young squad, like I looked at it the other day when we were beating Chelsea, and I'm like, a lot of these players, they're like super young, super like unrecognizable, but he's, he's doing a great job. Yeah, he's been, I think, like Adura said, not being in Europe at all really helped them to focus a bit on the objective of getting back into the Champions League. Poor results from other teams around them that were expected to do better have also helped. But the fact is that Arteta has really improved us now. Not just the young players, he's gotten better from older players like Xhaka, like um, Tierney. Tierney was back to his best this season before he got injured. And so the signings Arsenal have made have been really good, like Tom Yasu, um, Ben White have both had very good seasons on Ramsdale. They really need that upgrade in the goalkeeper position. Yeah, and it, it just seems like 5 1 next season at Bayern Munich, right? Yeah, yeah that Bayern bullied them instead of us. <laughs> sure. But, yeah, to wrap things up, do any of you follow the Belgian League? No. I saw you oh, tweeting okay. about it, though. Yeah, so I'm going to, pardon me, I'm just going to. Y- Union sends Gilois. Yeah, yeah, that's the team. That's the team everyone should be following right now because. They're having a special season. They, they're recently promoted. I think that, they, that is a surprise package with their condition. Yeah, yeah. Because right now, the way things work in Belgium, right, is they have a regular season and they top the regular season. But sadly, the points are half and they have to play playoffs with the four, top four in Belgium. So that's Andalek, Club Brugge, themselves, and Royal Antwerp. And if they win the Belgian, they'll be in the Champions League. The first time they've been in the UEFA competition in their history, which is for, for a club that just came out. 
for a club that just came, that just got promoted this season, that would be one crazy hell of a season. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah, I recommend everyone to put their eyes on that if they're like looking for any feel good stories to follow your game. Yeah, but with that, that's all we have for this week. We wish our Spanish clubs good luck in Europe, and thanks, Sergio, for coming on. Oscar, yeah, uh, my pleasure. Yeah, and I wish everyone a wonderful weekend, and I wish you guys peace. Adios.